30 seconds late on what might have been the quote of the podcast. It's a wrestling perspective. That's Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell. We're sitting here with EC3. Thank you, man. You carved out a couple minutes out of your night. We truly appreciate the time you're taking to hang out with us. I carved out about 45, but I'm willing to go 47 for you, boy. <laughs> 48. Can you say please? Yeah. 30 <laughs> seconds ago, I had a, one of many of my choice quotes, but uh, let's not be afraid. I say what it is. And how it is. And I say my truth and my truth seals really right. I never lie. Maybe I embellish it. Sometimes I am a storyteller, but I do not lie. And a fisherman. Because <laughs> <laughs> they always embellish the, what they catch. It oh, was yeah. Why? Big. I, oh, big. You said that. And I just thought of like Danny Glover and Joe Pesci and gone fishing for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'll, I'll take it, man. That's, that's yeah, awesome. Too. Uh, huge thanks to Petey Williams, who actually set this interview up for us. Uh, rest in peace, Pete. He's taking a nap. He's not dead. So, oh, that's good. Yeah, because like we've been talking about it for kind of a long years. time. And, yeah, almost. Yeah. No, 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 almost. This has been years in the making. I guess so. And it's just like time escapes us. So much happens. Petey, though, I mean, I honor his legacy. May he rest in peace with this nap. Uh, despite my ban... And CYN on the Canadian Destroyer, I do appreciate the art and impact of the move that he made famous. So, yeah, you know what? You bring up the band, and I'm going to kind of just jump into the questions is, uh, is is a band necessary? Could we have just put a like a, a one move per show uh, thing on it? Do we do we have to ban moves here? We could have done anything we wanted to do because when you control the narrative, you can just make it up as you go along. But part of my reality towards wrestling is how these amazing athletic moves have been so thrown away by overuse. They have no effectiveness. They have no reason. They have no rhyme. And these are some of the coolest, quote, moves, physical feats that wrestling has to offer. And they're just, they're thrown away. So by banning them, I therefore made them far more, you know, effective than they've ever been. They mean more. And in fact, there have been super kicks on CYN shows. And every time that's happened, maybe the ref's back was turned. Maybe someone got disqualified. But every time somebody got kicked in the face, they were hurt and they lost. So it works. My super kicks work in my company. So that's cool. So with that being said, psychology is obviously very, very important to you. Yes, I think it's a lost art and it's not that hard to recapture. And I think with psychology and just some just some thought, uh, we've gone way too far beyond, you know, psychology in general. And I think it could be easily scaled back and more meaningful and therefore products are better because they have more meaning. So, you know, I like delayed gratification. What can I say? Well, I know you're a no-holds-barred guy. Sorry, Dennis. I need to go after this question. Who the fuck do you blame that on? I, there's, yeah. I guess Al Gore, because he created the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, culture and society itself, I think we've created bubbles within our, you know, certain interests and niches and things like that where... Everybody has a voice now, which is great. Freedom of speech. Everyone should have an opinion and is entitled to their opinion. But it's so easily accessible by so many people that make decisions. The forefronts, the leaders of these brands, these niches, these sports, this entertainment, that it affects the thoughts of the people that create it so much so because it feedbacks instant. And it just because it's instant doesn't mean it's the majority. You know, so I think who to blame it on it's not really blame as much as just what has progressed with how fast everything moves that talent now office people within wrestling everybody has access to the internet and you know you do want to make sure your product is good so feedback is great but seeking immediate feedback what you're getting is from a small minority but it's if they love it or they hate it, that's your immediate reaction. And it has no time to digest and you have no time to see the consequences of it over real time with the vast majority. So the, the niche, they love, you know, 
athletic high spots. And of course, so it's just giving them more and more and more. And then their opinions have weight and merit to the people that are making decisions where perhaps we forgot what brought us to the dance, what psychology is, the art of professional wrestling. And this goes from the very top, from WWE to AEW to any, you know, televised brand to like the legends of the past. They get that feedback so quick that it's either change of perspective or they're saying times have changed, but they lost focus on what brought us all here. And that's, you know, the art of wrestling. Your company had a lot of hiccups. None of them were yeah, your fault. Still have <laughs> yeah. But but none of them were your fault, but yet you, you keep chugging along and you keep overcoming them. And well, it seems I mean, none of them are a fault per se, but I think one thing, and this totally lacks in wrestling, is the burden of leadership and people pass blame so easily. So though I've never been directly anything ridiculous accused of or these, you know, hateful things people say about somebody, me, they don't know, like none of it's true, but it is my fault because I am the leader of it. Well, I, I can contest and through PD, uh, he has nothing but glowing things to say about you. And if PD thinks you are a good guy, everybody should think you're a good guy. That's yeah. not my question. I'm done kissing your ass. So fuck oh, I love it. Fuck her up. <laughs> well, like, and then, you know, the one thing too about, you know, trying something different and thinking outside the box. And I'm sure this is the same for music. You give them the greatest hits and they know it and they love and they're conditioned to. And if you give them something different, they hate it no matter what until it has time to resonate and maybe they can digest it or, you know, their perspectives change a little bit, but the initial reaction of anything new is if I don't understand it, I hate it. Or if I don't know it, I hate it. Or if it's not being vouched for by the, the minds that control the narrative, so to speak, like the internet, we're going to hate it. So I'm glad because you just answered half my question, but the other half is with the fans, they, you know, a little bit kicking and screaming. They were kind of coming along there for a little bit, but what was the reaction from the boys, your friends, maybe some leadership in other companies to this company that you were building up? I think there was an appreciation for trying something different. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think one thing that we did have a fault with, and this happens when you're brand new, you're an upstart, but you know suddenly we're dealing with one of the top names in wrestling, and a lot of caveats come with that, and a lot of things, the delusions of grandeur, I would call them, that we could be something we're not meant to be yet so very quickly that a lot got lost in the shuffle. But I think within the industry, peers, when I started doing the narrative thing and you know, creating my own character, so to speak, there was a lot of uh, kudos and congratulations, and I would love the chance to do that. And that's kind of what brought me to it, creating Control Your Narrative so other people can have that opportunity because I got was so fulfilled from it as a creator. So, you know, I don't know about the high, high level of the industry and what they think of it. I'm sure a couple of people in high levels hate my guts because they listen and believe the internet is true, which is a terrible sign of leadership and a terrible idea if you are uh, in a high level position in this company or this industry. But I mean, overall, from those within, it's, it was very positive. Do you think, because this is something I've been sort of wrestling with, no, <laughs> uh, all, all puns intended. Oh. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, but I feel like with video games, internet, and just this idea that we can create inside of a video game and create matches and create, I mean, you know, there's story modes and all these things. And then people get this idea that they're like these booking, you know, bookers. Um, do you feel like the, uh, the culture that we're in now with professional wrestling, um, the younger culture, um, do you think that there is a lack of respect for um, what has been done prior to them getting there or getting to the table? I, I think I can totally see that. And it wasn't so many years ago that I was not a fan that resided on the internet. And so in those times, like I can, I resonate with, I thought I knew everything because I was reading this insider and this insider, but it wasn't until I stepped in the industry 
saw for what it was. It wasn't until I saw things about myself being reported that I knew weren't true, where it was like sort of an awakening to what what can happen with information so quickly and the fact if this happens on such a low level with something as meaningless as professional wrestling imagine what's going on in our reality with real news and things like that so just made me question everything i think uh there is probably a lack of respect and i don't know if that's a gen z thing or a late millennial thing because I don't want to be the old man yelling at a cloud because I'm still fairly young. But it does seem that respect is lost to these people with the you know, the younger crowd with that voice based on majority of them have never done anything for themselves. They never created art. They never made music. They never played sports. They kind of had this sheltered, entitled life that, and again, I don't want to sound like a crazy old man yelling at a cloud, you know, they haven't really worked for anything. So it's very easy to disregard what people have done in the past if you don't understand what it takes to get to certain levels. Katie and I had a conversation uh, probably a year or so ago. We were talking about the most successful wrestlers that were kayfabe related to other people in the industry. Uh, we made a case that you might have been maybe 1A, 1B, oh. the most successful guy who Dixie Carter's, you know, relative. And I think we made the case that like Paul White or Big Show when they did the whole, you know, uh, Andre the Giant Son thing. But you two were probably the most successful of the two that have been branded to be related to somebody who maybe not. Was there ever a time? when you were leaving TNA where you were like, mm, this Ethan Carter thing isn't going to work for me because you stuck with it and you brought it with you to the WWE. I always want to ask you that. Maybe related inside note. I'm in Nashville. Currently we have some NWA tapings tomorrow and I texted my dear sweet aunt. Hey, I'm going to be in town. I don't know if you want to get together, grab a coffee, maybe have a glass of wine and a steak. And she did not respond. But you just Whoa. I know. Shocking it's the fucking news. holidays, too. Shocking news, Aunt D Fabes EC3's text. So now I'm on her cancel list too. So be it. I never really looked at it the K Fabe relation category, and to be ranked so high means wow, nobody's really accomplished that because there's been so many. That's my son, that's my cousin, nephew, brother, you know. I guess Kane and Undertaker would have to be the top spot as far as. Um, I... Uh, I mean, you you kind of knew though that Kane and Undertaker weren't related. I mean, you you, you kind of knew that. With you, there was like a legit, you know, thing that was happening. And even with you know Paul White, he did look like Andre. He, I well, mean, he, there was some some you know similarities there. You know. Well, so, hell. I I don't mind being on top of a list, man. That's pretty sweet. So there you go. Kudos to the chemistry of Aunt D and I. We've had some good times, and hopefully she returns my text. Well, it's I do. Me. Here's, here's <laughs> a thing. when CYN had the gigantic ambitions to do a full tour with absolutely no infrastructure. Uh, I had this idea to kind of do a parody press conference you know, about the tour and things like that and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, talk about how I've done this on my own. I am self-financed. We have had no backing. We've had nobody help us. We've gotten here on our blood, sweat, grit, and, you know, toiling through the mud ourselves to get to this position. But also I do want to announce, I now have a majority investor and here's my aunt. So I thought that would probably get a great reaction and shock some people, but never happened because we didn't have the tour. But, but the name change, uh, did you ever think oh, about yeah. it? I thought about it two ways. The way I went and the way I look back on it, the way I went kind of towards the end of Impact when Dixie was kind of transitioning out and Anthem was coming in, I kind of tried to just brand it EC3. So as the relation kind of left and, you know, the story, you know, paid off and went very far, I kind of knew what's next where am I going to go? My intention is to go back to the WWE at this point, but I created a name and a brand that is known and kind of resonates. So immediately that's an advantage to have 
unless you're going to the WWE where they want to recreate you. But I kind of transitioned it just to EC3 because anything in threes kind of, there's a subliminal thing to it. It's easy to chant. It sounds cool. My autograph's real easy to do. So the name change, in theory, it wasn't like I disavow my aunt and we end the storyline, but I just try to get away from the fact I have a relation to somebody in a wrestling company as opposed to I am a rich prick with three characters as a name. So looking back on it, though, that's a lot about talking about if you try to repeat the past and... uh Man, I drew a blank. If you try to repeat the past or, you know, stick with what's always worked, sometimes it's going to run its course and it's never going to be as good as it was. So in that theory, looking back, could I have went over to WWE with something completely different and succeeded? Yes or no, you know, hindsight 2020. But I do look at that as that maybe that I should have left it there and tried something completely new a la what I'm doing now, which in theory, my name is still EC3, but I'm now the essential character. So it's hard to get away from a brand that works though, you know? So. Well, we touched, the question. <laughs> um, we touched on the very vocal minority sort of, you know, dictating for the majority. And, I, and uh, but one of the things that you just touched on was the kayfabe aspect. So a guy like, MJF, who's out there, basically, no matter where the dude goes, is living the gimmick. And yeah. it's working. It's working to the point where I think he's probably the greatest heel that's happening right now. He can go into the ring. He can have proper wrestling matches. Um, he uses his 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 uh, his voice for and and his promo to elevate himself. Um, I think his his in ring work is is good. Um, what are your opinions on on what he's doing right now? I'm just curious because of you know where you're at in your life. Well, uh, I'll have you know that a young MJF did attend an EC3 seminar and stood out to a young EC3 hosting that seminar. But what I feel bad about is when I was coming up as EC3. You know, just the low-brained ignorance of people is like, you're just copying Ted DiBiase, and then you're just copying Alberto Del Rio. I'm like, there's only so many things you can do. A rich guy, no, like, yeah, all right, we're all rich, but I'm way different than the Million Dollar Man, and I'm way different oh, than, wow. than, like, getting past that criticism, it wasn't hard, but I could see it affecting people. And then when he was coming up, you're just a bootleg EC3. He's not. He never was. He was his own man and he was his own talent. And he's very, very exceptional at it. I think uh, what I do enjoy, you know, the commitment to kayfabe per se, like he lives like a real dick. He probably is a real dick. If you went to an EC3 seminar, he's probably a total dick bag. He knows. But it's very, very difficult when the fans want to cheer you. And they are cheering you. And you can get them to turn back on you. And I saw him do that a couple of times where I'm like, that that's impressive because it's very easy to fall into the, well, the fans are reacting this way. We should just roll with it. Like the commitment to being an antagonist, I commend a lot. So I think he's doing some great work. My one fear for him, and it's not really a fear, is I just didn't know who there could elevate him because before he became champion he was kind of always in the same boat like I think he needed somebody to bring something out of him that was different before he could become the top guy and maybe I missed it because I don't watch a ton of it maybe it was punk but I guess that step did happen oh it, it, it was it was punk it was yeah. straight up was punk I mean come on who else That's could could have done that I mean, sorry. I mean, he, oh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm a little biased because you know I've known that dude. He's one of my best friends. He's like a family member. But I mean, if you just see that what they were able to do together, then you realize that MJF came up a level, and that's what he did with all those guys. But that I digress. So, no, but you're you're absolutely right because you know I didn't have clear indication, but I'm glad that was said because like who else could do that but Punk, like somebody that's been everywhere and been at the top levels of you know WWE. And like the intricacies and depth of storytelling that people that are obsessed with this, like MGF, Punk, myself, are 
to bring that out of him, to bring him to the next level. I'm glad that happened because I thought that was one missing piece. So now there's just, just one more guy left that can really fuck him up. Well, Ethan, if I can call you that, I have a grievance to take up with you. And, Uh-oh. Uh, Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, control control your narrative, Dennis. Oh, this is I'm setting a narrative on this one. Hey, bring <laughs> your fucking podcast back. I actually fucking love listening to it, and all of a sudden it's just gone. You know, uh, the Matt Taven inter- interview, one of my favorites. The Vincent one was great, and all of a sudden you're just gone. Hey, fuck you, bring it back. I want to listen to you to interview people. You're smart, you're great. It was thoughtful, insightful. Fuck, F- fuck me, right? Yeah. Fuck. Well, I'm only trying to lead a revolution. I'm trying to start a company. I'm trying to run two multiple businesses. I'm the only one that does anything. But yeah, I didn't have time to complete it. I am and I want to bring it back with a new realm and kind of like a variety hour with talking heads and like match breakdowns. And I filmed a bunch of matches of like local independent guys. I'm calling them scraps where some are good and some are really bad, but I want to air them all. And like, if they're really bad, I got a shit on them. And I think they'll be entertaining, but I'm glad you liked it. Cause it always was something that was under the radar. And if you were one of our 12 listeners, then I commend you, but it was at the time, so much is taking place at once. If I can't fully commit to this, or it's not an option where, you know, I have the assets and somebody that can, I can show up press play, let's go, I can leave, everything else takes care of itself. Like, that's what I need and, you know, try to surround myself with. So I'm not good at editing. Like, I don't know audio. I don't know what a decibel is, man. Shit. But I would like to bring that back within the new year because I think what Control Your Narrative has to be, the intention was never to be a promotion. I never wanted to be a three-letter brand with championships and weekly live TV, you know, and like, I wanted it to be an idea and a brand where people go to create themselves or reinvent themselves and work within collaborations with high level independents or television companies where when you know we show up, shit's going to get real. And then, you know, it's a ever changing ensemble cast. Like I focus on a few guys that should be in the spotlight and, you know, you mix and match and you can just create so many different intriguing matchups and, bring a lot of talent for the ride. So that's the intention and that's what I want to do. And that's what I'll do and probably need a weekly show to talk about it. I need a weekly propaganda hour to spew my bullshit. You're absolutely right. Thank you for the motivation. (laughs) You're welcome. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that you said early in the interview is what that you feel like you belong in the WWE. And if, and if I'm not mistaken, that's what you were saying, but if that is the case, why do you belong there? And what's the reason? What made you think I said that? I thought that's what you said. Can we rewind the tape, Dennis? Can we go to uh, picture in picture? Uh, the refs are in the instant replay right now. They're coming back with did, a red flag. You, no. Then then maybe you uh, maybe I, you didn't mention that. So let I, me rephrase the question. Let me rephrase the question. Where is the place for you to be? What promotion? Is it what you're doing? It could be whatever the answer it is because you're creating your own shit, right? So, and why is that? Well, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I do belong in the very shiniest, hottest spotlight possible with the most amount of pressure and the most amount of eyeballs on me. So I'm not saying you're wrong, but maybe when I was talking about I was going back to WWE from the EC3 character. Oh, yeah. Maybe, 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 maybe that's where I. But, but you, you know, hey, I'm not. Hey. I'm not Kanye. I'm not going to get up and walk out of the interview because we had a minor spat. You're if right. You're wearing, if you're wearing Yeezy boots, we're fucking we're ending this shit anyways right now. So I'm just kidding. I do. Right. Anyway, go ahead. He's not canceling my shoes. They're too damn comfortable. But uh, <laughs> man, that's a really a great question because there's so many avenues for this. And you know, as a musician with notable fame and things like that, let me ask you: like, where does your passion and heart lie and how much does it outweigh the monetary gain? Like how much control do you want in creative fulfillment and, you know, practicing your art, your way, are you willing to trade for more fame and more money? So it goes a variety of ways. Belonging in the WWE. Yeah. 
probably the probably the best talker in wrestling. I don't know, maybe MJF, but we can we can <laughs> miss and match that. Uh, but like you know, aesthetically, look wise, you know, psychology, things like that. I think that's kind of the model I work under. But at the same time, if I were to go back, at what level would I be going back? Because honestly, the first two runs weren't great. Management has changed, and they're probably like me more than the last guy but at the same time it's stacked and to right. get get through that to get to where i want to be happy with myself being on top like at what point is it like well you know i'm solidly in the mid card and i'm making good money and you know this is cool but then you know you think of an AEW and how i'm totally outside the box for them they probably couldn't handle all this heat but at the same time, that's kind of what the industry needs, and it needs a boat rocked, and it needs to be shaken up. And so there'd be a lot of damage to be done there. I mean, Impact, I made my name in, and, you know, I went back and finished it. So it's kind of, I did it. And that's how I'm always looking for the next challenge. That's why I went right, over right. Ring of Honor. But then Ring of Honor became, which is, a, you know, a mm -hmm. form of, bad management and diseases apparently and viruses. So then we have NWA and like-minded and leadership wise, I really enjoy what Billy's doing. And I do like his attitude because it is his, he knows what he wants. He does not listen or placate to people's opinions to get positive wrestling media press or to impress, you know, a niche fan base. His target is to go for, you know, the lost fan, the 7 million that used to watch wrestling, what can bring them back to it? How does he do that? And he's been very smart because he started very small and he just slowly built. He didn't take on too much at once and it's constantly on the rise. So now I'm a part of this where we're on the rise and can I be a guy that drives it to the next level? It's a great challenge, but at the same time it's unproven. So do I lose out on the monetary aspect? So where do I belong? I belong exactly where I am. Oh, come on. In this moment. Well, that's the thing. You, you know, you everything that's ever happened through time and space has put us here in this moment together for some, to have this conversation, you know. Best friends now. Yeah, we're best friends now. And that's Michael Singer from the Living Untethered I just listened to as an audiobook. <laughs> well, no, I agree with I agree with that statement 120%. And I think as the older that you get excuse me the more experience that you get throughout your career like you were talking about oh well you know creative uh expression is way more important than uh finance and pressure or whatever it is i mean i feel like if you're going to create there's always got to put you always have to have a little bit of pressure right because i feel like that gets the juices flowing but i do believe that you are where you are by design like there's no coincidence anymore it's all about this is where you're supposed to be. There's obviously a lesson here, you know, learn it or I'm going to serve it up to you again. It just might be in a different place and you're not going to really break through that glass ceiling until you learn that lesson. And I think an important thing is that I, again, hearken back to leadership within the industry and I have learned many lessons. Have I learned that lesson yet completely? No, but that is why I'm here. But so many people on the come up don't know these challenges come and i do very much enjoy being on the i don't want to say the ground floor but like scouting who's next and finding people and hearing their real story and it's you know sometimes so far more intriguing than the fake wrestling bullshit they portray on an independent show it's always way better anytime i do classes like promos and things these guys come up there and cut their hacky dumbass fucking wrestling 101 promo and then three to five questions later, they're bearing their soul. There's grown men crying, like they're coming out of their shell. And they're like, there's no reason you should be that. This is who you are. And then to see them run with that and then kind of, you know, they're not succeeding yet, but to see them growing and doing better is very fulfilling. But then again, personal narcissism aside, I've had a good career but I don't have a lasting legacy because my WWE success never happened. So is that still in the back of my mind? And while I can still go at a very high level, is that something 
that I want to, you know, check off. So I just make sure that, you know, that box is checked. Yes. But can I live with not doing it? Yes. Well, Hunter does listen to this podcast, so I'm sure he'll hear these comments. So, you know, I, I've got it from good authority. He's a huge listener. So, Hunter, yeah. I, by the way, yeah. thanks for listening. But I but just I, watched him. Sorry. I got caught in a wrestling bubble today because, like, sometimes I'm so desensitized by it. And I just like it's so hard to watch because I think so highly of what we can do and we're not doing it that just like ignoring it sometimes makes me feel good that it still has integrity. And plus, I think as a creator, if you're watching everything that's currently happening, you're going to be affected by it and create amongst the lines, whether you know it or not. So kind of staying off the grid to see your ideas through, it's kind of important. But I was just watching Triple H and Jericho in the last man standing match, like right before we did this podcast. That's why I was late. Uh, I think it was like fully loaded. I don't know if it's like 2000 or 2002. But God, the the crowd, the story, like, and they're doing cool moves, but the intensity they would, you know, they portrayed. Oh man, that shit was so good. And like, I I don't see why we're not doing that anymore. You you were call me, Paul. Sorry, <laughs> call him uh, if he needs your number. Paul, text me. I can get you. I I'm actually text buddies now with Mister Carter, so I can get it to Paul if he needs it. Thanks, D. I'll wait. No problem, bud. Um, but you you might have been the guy who started the blueprint on how to be successful during COVID. After your release, you changed your look all up, which I, I can't wait to deep dive into the creative process. But uh, you changed your look up. You you may have had the biggest buzz out of anybody who had gotten released because you started doing these promos. You were You were not the same Ethan Carter. So when you go, you get released, and you, do you immediately think, all right, shit's got to change? Does someone sit you down? What is the linchpin for this major creative con- uh, creative turn for you? It was something I wanted to do, and it was sort of a uh, – it was after a really bad concussion, so maybe I just lost my mind. But <laughs> it was during NXT, and uh, I'm like – Harken to what we were saying before about EC3 and, you know, should I have been, been something different? Like, I had this long-form pitch of this kind of idea, this, I mean, you call it Fight Club ripoff. Why not? Everything's a ripoff of something. But this, you know, cult leader, underground, self-actualized, you know, nihilist fucking badass who, you know, it's like Kaiser Soze, like, the long-form plan always works out, even if he has to sacrifice himself to do it. So I had this long form pitch and I pitch it. And then two weeks later, I was called up to the main roster for my ill-fated run. So like, it's something I wanted to do. Obviously the main roster run went bad. I had another bad concussion. I was out for a few months. At the same time when I'm coming back from this injury, COVID's happening. I haven't been at TV for a while. And they're like, Hey, we need you at TV this week, right? In like pandemic times. And I'm like, I, I can't show up the same. And this is during COVID when things were closing down. So on the way, because we're filming at the PC, I drove, like, I'm, like, driving there. And there's just this barber shop. And I just, fuck it. And I turn in. And I just, like, shave my head. All right. So they shave my head. And I show up to TV. And I kind of got the peach fuzz going. And I look different. Head shaved. You have a promo today. This is going to be on Raw. And Raw was taped. I'm like, Great. Because I'm so unhappy and I'm so miserable that I either need to get fired or I need to do something drastic and change, you know, and either way is fine. So I'm like, all I need is the promo. Like, that's it. That's all that matters. And, you know, here's your script. I'm like, uh-huh. Fucking saying one of these words. Like I had the promo in my mind. It was very much kind of what I'm doing now. And the segment happens or like right before the segment happens, I'm walking out. Cause it was like a match, but you get a promo before the match. I'm like, cool. All right. Right before my music hits guy in the back's like your promo's cut. And I'm, like, 
I'm like, and like, it never aired on TV, but like, I walked, like, I was, I was defeated. And that's hard to admit because I hate saying it, but it, it, I was beaten and I was done. And then the segment happened and never saw on TV. They brought me to the back and I kind of cut a half ass version of the promo. But like, when that segment ended, I empty PC, no live audience. I'm just sitting on the, the floor after this match. And I'm like, I, I, I can't do this anymore. And then two weeks later, we were fired. But when I got fired, it was a relief. Despite the fact we're in a world-changing pandemic, I don't know if I'm going to have a job ever again. I don't know if wrestling's going to exist. But it was like just such a relief because it had to happen. I wish it happened. I wish I did the promo, and then I got fired immediately. I think that would have been a better story. But coming from that, the day I was fired, I filmed the first promo I did. And I filmed it right before I was fired. So I was going to upload that promo regardless that day. Film it doing yoga, get fired, smile, finish yoga, and upload the promo. And I'm like, this is the direction I want to go. And they never let me talk. So until this, you know, 90 days is up, I'm going to cut a better promo than is on Raw or SmackDown that week, no matter what. So that's why I just kept coming. Do you feel like you sort of vindicated yourself a little bit by, you know, I don't know. It's almost like you get defeated, like you said. You get, you know, disenfranchised from the company that you're working for. You know, you've been out with injuries, these things. And all of a sudden, that firing is the beginning of this vindication for yourself. Maybe maybe it's more of a uh, a self-serving kind of thing for yourself. For, for what I mean is like, you know, there's obviously been some introspection there. And you, you, you kind of come, come to grips with like, ah, fuck it. I think you said it exactly the way I looked at it. It was vindication of self. But if it was grand scheme, here's my revenge. Fuck the world. You're going to want me back. I don't I don't feel that vindication. But I didn't seek that vindication. The vindication I needed was solely for myself. Like the characters harking about finding purpose and things like that. And that was just very real to me. Just kind of, you know, amp it up and put fucking cool music to it. But... Yeah, the vindication was definitely for self, and I had that. And at the same time, in the process, it was talked about, but then where it became and what it became with all the lies and the mistruths and the sabotage and the delusions of grandeur, like a, a large group of the niche wrestling fan hate me because of it. And that's okay, because... Guess what? Pro wrestling bad guys are supposed to be hated, but they're hated for like a, a very real truth and a very real pursuit. So the vindication of self, yes, was I vindicated to the wrestling world? You know, some of them hate me and they think I'm horrible and a terrible person. And then uh, companies, literally, I, major companies, ownership thinks I'm literally, you know, far right accepting money from Mike Lindell because they believe the internet. And that's insane to me that anyone would think that, especially with, as you mentioned, like PD, how he speaks of me, you know, I have a very good reputation within the industry amongst the talent because I'm truly, you know, one of them. So I vindicated myself. Is my career vindicated? No. Does it need to be? I don't know. What's the, what's the end goal? Am I going to be Van Gogh, you know, cutting my ear off and dying before my great genius is recognized? Maybe, maybe not. But will it ever be recognized? Will I always be kind of a niche guy that had a good run and lost his mind? Or will I be a niche guy that like, dude, this guy was completely underrated. Look at all this stuff he did. But it's never going to be the mainstream acceptance of a top level WWE superstar and I accept that, but at the same time, does it vindicate me? To self, yes. Overall, I don't know. As, as a fan of yours, uh, and self-admittedly, I'm I am a fanboy of yours. Have been for a long time. I don't see this version of you going to a major company, and I'm I'm 
I may be speaking out of turn here, but I don't think your bank account might be happy, but I don't think you will be happy. Uh, I think you're right where you should be. You, you're creating something. You're working with you know, other companies that appreciate you. And if the mainstream WWE fan doesn't appreciate you, fuck them. But you know what? The NWA guy, the, the people that go to the control your narrative, uh, the wrestlers that may not have been able to get into a ring will appreciate you. Yeah. And like just today, there's this young quote intern I had who did some video work for us. I'm oh, 45, but okay. You did, dude. You did. <laughs> No, it's a 21 year old kid. I met him in a barber shop. He needed, like, he was a wrestling fan. And uh, we're filming the narrative thing. He he wanted to do a school project. So the barber asked if I'd do it. And I'm like, yeah, man, cool. Kid's a huge fan. And like, he filmed it and like, he was totally nervous and things like that. I'm like, what are you doing later? He's like, uh, you know, I don't know, nothing. And I'm like, meet me here at whatever, two o'clock. It's this diner. And that's where I shot like, Matt Cordona and I sit down and have a cup of coffee and just talk shit to each other. But I'm like, bring your stuff. And the next thing you know, he's, you know, filming it. Then he's editing it. Then he worked, you know, with us on so many different things and little projects. And I was almost like a surrogate father to him. And as he interned and worked his way and he got on the road, he was in, you know, traveling to towns. He saw the chaotic rock star lifestyle we can live sometime. And it's just like this sheltered young kid like is living the dream in a sense and we did that for a year and just today he called me to tell me he got like a job based on the resume and the work he did with us and what he created wow and like ah yeah man it was like that fulfilled me very much that's definitely you know those those are the small victories now right um, and that's very cool. It's, you know, it sounds like there's positive change in your life and you're changing people positively. Um, I guess, you know, I don't want to get into the negative and, and sat, sit in that mire, but I do have a question regarding, uh, the perception because everything in the world right now is so polarized, right? And people have opinions, honestly, people who have opinions who shouldn't fucking have opinions, I mean, let's just be honest. I know we're all human beings and we, we're all going to have those. But I, I just think about where you've been, you know, and through the pandemic, and then you talk about this change, and then you talk about the positive change that you're having with people, and then you're talking about the negativity that comes your way. And Lord knows there's a lot of negativity now in the world, probably more so than ever, because, you know, everybody thinks that their way is the right way. Um what keeps you, what deflects, what, what keeps you in that positive space? Because as all this shrapnel coming in your way, you got to bring up a barrier. I got to do it too, right? Anybody who's in a public eye to some degree has to do it. Um, what keeps you sort of focused, pushing forward, deflecting all that? You know, it's, I don't know how it's affected you, but you know, it was, it's not easy. And it's not to say I'm a victim, feel bad for me. It's just, it's not easy. Not because I can't take it, but because the people that are around me who see it secondhand and, you know, actually look at things like that, see it. I mean, to have your mother call you and go, why are they saying you're this? And I'm like, no, <laughs> Dude, that's my boy, you know? And it's like, yeah. you know, you can take the arrows and the slings and know hopefully that it works out in the end and it's for a greater good and a greater purpose and more people like the story I just told and so many more I can tell within the early phases of this idea that have taken place are worth it, but it does grind on you. And it does get you. And there's a lot of times there's hesitation and doubt and second guessing and it's, it's almost like you know, if you don't read it, it doesn't exist. So, mm -hmm. like, but at the same time, you're going to have to face it and, you know, either work within it or, you know, work within it or work with it and use it to your advantage, which is another idea. It's just having the right 
long-term goal within it and leaning into that because at the same time the world's polarized culture's deranged everyone's insane but you can create great art out of that you know oh fuck yeah fuck yeah (laughs) and especially if it's not like you're not you're not kanyeing it and like whatever the hell you're saying on alex jones i'm like that what you know but he is a guy that has taken you know a bunch of things and has always succeeded beyond it until now i don't think there's any coming back from this probably not (laughs) but it isn't easy but at the same time maybe it's necessary because if you're not going to be the one that takes it somebody else will or the change you want to see will never happen or never have a chance to happen and it's not to paint yourself as a this is pro wrestling i'm you know we're not changing the world per se but i'm not a martyr but being the one that you know stood up and took it all so it can move forward and kind of like find itself find its way again i guess it's ambitious and bold so many people just lack you know the the term courage so many people lack it because no matter what they're going to face backlash regardless from the smallest little minute things to you know epic changes in you know history and culture and things like that so this isn't that but to be a model for other people to be to know that they can they can be themselves and to truly embody control your narrative what does that mean tell your story so to be the paragon of your own virtue tell your story control your narrative you know unapologetically be you well let me just take the opportunity to say that if if i've said anything in this interview that has offended anybody fucking blow me man suck suck on his hog blow me i don't give a shit fuck you fuck the horse you ran out Fuck your family. Fuck everyone. That fuck, fuck you. Okay, Dennis. On behalf See, of was- everybody, I do not uh, agree with those <laughs> statements from uh, EC3 or Lars Fredrickson. Uh, but by the well, way, you want to know why? Because there's no grit to you. None. There's nothing. None at all. None. 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 I'm a people pleaser. I love You're everybody fucking- out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Here's a, term, here's, a, here's a term I'm throwing around now. I'm going to call it the low T I W C. All right. That made me laugh. So. Wow. I've never felt least masculine in my life until now. Thank now, you. I, the wrestling perspective where even the host can get emasculated. Yeah. Well, I love the way you say it too, because it's like at this long drawn out, like kind of like political toe the line answer. But the reality inside my head is like, fuck you, shut up. <laughs> uh, look at you. Look at you, you fucking pathetic. Uh, you, you can't let the opinion of somebody you don't respect uh, affect you. That's the, the big course. That's my... You, it, it, you, it, you, yeah. I, nothing you say can affect me because I don't respect you. There's not one thing on this fucking planet that you can say to me that I have not said worse to myself. You Trust pretty me. eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's and, fair. <laughs> They're brown because I'm full. Yeah. All right. I I know that you've got other things to do, and I've got a couple more questions. I could I could interview. He's got he's got to go watch more Jericho matches. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, uh, you had this drastic change in character and wrestling fans, and I've been known to do this myself. It's so hard to let go of a character we love and let him evolve. And I think as wrestling fans, we need to learn how to let a character evolve, even though we know we'll never see the character we fell in love with again. And it breaks my heart because I loved TNA or impact EC three. Do you ever sometimes go, I can make a ton more money if I did this again. And do you, do you sometimes have to like talk yourself out of, you know, uh, digging up that old character and going, you know what? That's a car payment. I'm about to, you know, be this guy again. Yeah. You know, it's usually comes at the uh, end of my shift working a glory hole where I'm like, you know, (laughs) that's what I'm doing next. So I know that shift. Keep it, keep it open. Uh, 
No, you're a hundred percent right. Does that happen? It it does. And you know, you can't you can't live in the past or think about the past, but I can go back into the past, and the past wasn't that far ago where that was an offer to me from a high level company to come in and do that exact thing while I'm going through, you know, the affirmated character change, but also the real life change that was taking place within me. And I just, I couldn't do it because I, I, like I said to said representative, I can't act like nothing has happened. I can't act like this character it didn't have the shit WWE run, got his brain knocked in. I can't act like he didn't lose his job in a pandemic. I can't act like, you know, he doesn't know what's next and he's living, you know, a minimalist lifestyle and like like a vagabond, couch surfing, just trying to figure it out. That wasn't true. You know, I always had a home. I'm not that bad. I but you can always stay with me. I bet I could. Yeah. But like, yeah, the thought of it, like that was Hey, we even want to use it. We even want to bring you in with the TNA theme music, Trouble, Trouble, Trouble. I love that song. They said, I'm like, that's that's cool, but I, I don't think I can do it because I'm not that person anymore. And some artists, some actors are really good and they can play a character, but like wrestlers aren't that good of actors. So the best wrestlers are the extensions of themselves. And at the time, the extension of myself was nowhere near that guy because that guy if he went through what i went through he would not be the same either well i used to think that pro wrestlers were the best one take actors and then i started watching the one world cup and i realized shit <laughs> they got nothing on soccer players so okay. i guess for my last question and to wrap it all up you know um over the over the course of time in your career the guys that you've been in and out of the ring with um is there is there been someone in specific that you can say this was a moment a pivotal moment in my life this person helped me change and 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 changed my trajectory and i'm not talking about your trainers i'm not talking about you know the beginning of your career i'm talking about well into your career has there been anybody like that for you yeah there's a few i would uh obviously the first one i'm going to say is kurt angle and when i was talking about the mgf you know step up to the next level kind of feud he needed which he had with punk that would have been my feud with Kurt. so right that was a time you know when ec3 came into impact it was mid card it's kind of funny you know it was entertaining it was oh this guy's a dick you know but like to be a top guy to be a world champion to be a face of a company you have to have you know a vicious side there has to be a danger to you you have to be a fucking killer at the same time. And it's very easy, especially today with, you know, how wrestlers are. It's just, they don't live it or feel it, or they don't see that next level. They're just going from match to match and move to move. And to me, not wearing the battle wounds that they've had over that course of time to get them to that moment, because it's very easy to be people like my music. People like when I, I do this taunt, people like when I do my finisher, it's so easy to do that, like to make yourself step up to the next level. Like Kurt did that for me. But the reason I was able to do that with Kurt is because I had that feud with Rockstar Spud prior. It was like, ah, one of my best buds. But we pretty much had heart blanche to kind of end our relationship the way we wanted to. And he's such a smart wrestling mind. Like he knew he knew where I'm going. I'm going to go to this level. And he had to be the guy to, to get me there to show there's a heinous, vicious fucking psychopathic prick inside this guy that kind of like waves his hands around and cheats to win all the time. Like, no, this guy's a real threat. And the reason I got to that point with him is because I had guys like Sting and I had guys like Bully Ray and Ken Anderson prior to that to get me ready. And I think the progression of EC3 and Impact was ha ha beating up, you know, fucking losers and having like, you know, get over matches to every time he got challenged, he get, he skinned by, like, you know, he beat the challenge, but he barely did. And it was by happenstance. But each time that happenstance happened, he learned something new and he got himself to this level, to this level, and he kept progressing. So 
Kurt to Spud, Matt Hardy was another one. Matt Hardy, real in-depth storyteller and a lot of context and, you know, Easter eggs within the the work he does. And I always appreciated that. And so working with him, it was a lot of fun to get to that next level of subconsciously planting things in people's heads that maybe they don't recognize now. But if you look back on it, they see the silver lining that brought us to this moment. And I think with that double turn we did in Bethlehem capsized that. Um, in ring, like, besides that, uh, honestly, I never worked with him, but Cena as a mentor and a guy I would turn to for advice and just general buddy stuff was a guy that was always there. And the things, not even asking questions, just listening to, him, listening to him talk as a perspective of the top guy of the industry, what's required to be there. You know, I took in a lot to try to, I did it on a very lower level, but like what I've heard him say and talk about, I really try to apply to my work. When I went to Ring of Honor, I think Jay Briscoe brought a lot mm. out of me because I think he was one of the best wrestlers that, you know, wrestling fans know him, but like he's not a mainstream guy, but I'm like, he was so good and very accepting of like how I saw this story play out and like totally on board because you go to Ring of Honor and this, you know, you're thinking it's going to be all about the moves and the high spots and that, but I'm like, we just need to have like a physical gritty, you know, fight to us. And like, it's got to be subliminal. And my goal too now is to do that for other people. So within NWA, like Tom Latimer is a guy, um, I want to be that so he can be brought to the level he should be at. And I'm very happy with the kind of work we've been doing thus far. So, well, we're almost at the end of the year. What does 2023 look like for EC3? I don't know, man. What does this month look like for EC3? How about this week? Can we can we go tomorrow? What does tomorrow look like? Tomorrow I'm going to wake up. I'm going to eat the breakfast I packed three days ago. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do lower body strength day. I'm going to have somebody pick me up. They're going to go to the NWA TV tapings. Probably going to do a bunch of wrestling stuff. Probably go back to the hotel, you know, cry myself to sleep like usual, then wake up again and do, you know, the same thing. But I'll probably do morning cardio Tuesday. And then, you know, I'll go do upper body strength and then we'll go back to NWA and we'll rock that out and, you know, put some good TV on in the can to get us to January. Like what I look forward to after that is, I don't know if it's been announced yet, but the first NWA date of January would be where I want to like, evolve the character one step further. So, and maybe that's even a more mainstream approach because as much cool character stuff that we're talking about, I've kind of been able to do. Sometimes you gotta like, you gotta bring it back down to a level where everybody could recognize it for it to succeed. If that makes sense. I gotta go mainstream a little bit, maybe. What am I gonna do with CYN? I want to brand it as an idea. I want to create the people that are next. I don't think there's any promotion that's like, who's next? Like, you know, there used to be the Ring of Honor and the Evolve and the PWG and these places and short of like AW Dark, NXT, like where is the next level of like, ah, you know, promising talent going to come from? And I think there's an opportunity to create that. And it wouldn't be within the promotional aspect of, hey, I'm a promotion, but it's in the aspect that CYN is an idea that travels from brand to brand, company to company, and, you know, putting people up a level. Wrote a comic book for, you know, Control Your Narrative, so I think it'd be a great way to facilitate people's backstories if I don't have easy access to create content with them always, so look for control your narrative to kind of get in that niche market. I think it'd be very cool if CYN was paying off their comic books with live shows at like comic cons that are full houses because, you know, there's 20,000 nerds there. So, you know, that's kind of cool and appealing to me. That may be financially beneficial. Seeing what goes on with NWA, can I help it grow? Is it ready to grow? Or do I need to take care of myself and finish what I started in the WWE? Or do I need to go off the beaten path and dare challenge the niche smart mark crowd of AEW. Like, I don't know. So 
I really don't know. They also well, have a big. Yeah, it sounds like you got a busy day tomorrow <laughs> doing all that, you know. But if you could do me a favor, because I'm a big NWA fan, I watch it religiously. Yeah. But please tell my good buddies, Ricky and Carrie Morton, that I send my love. Will ya? Can I tell you? You know, yeah. I don't want to. It's your podcast. It is. Yeah. Right. I don't want to spoil it, but the entire reason I banned Canadian Destroyers is because I want Ricky Morton to give me one. And then his son to come off the top rope and splash me and beat me. Like, that's the only reason I banned it. So, will that ever yeah, happen? You hate Canadians. <laughs> Taking it back. How long, <laughs> how long I planned it out. America. America. <laughs> Screw you, Petey Williams. No one likes yeah, you. Yeah, fuck you, Petey. Yeah, you your WWE like- job. Wait, oh. Tell Paul to call me. What the fuck? Well, I, yeah. Well, I mean, you already have one rock star calling you. Now two. I mean... Don't get too greedy, buddy. <laughs> There's a yeah, a fun story when like the hurricane was coming through Florida. I think it was Irene and everyone. Jane Helms. Yeah. <laughs> back. Like I'm with no power, like losing my mind alone. Like feel like Bruce Wayne, the beginning of the Dark Knight Rises, like peeing in my own jars, like Howard Hughes. Or, like I'm only trapped for a day, but. I was like, I have nobody to talk to about like kind of what I'm going through in life right now. Cause this is after, you know, Adam goes back to WWE and like this, you know, six months of work I put in kind of goes off or not. But at the same time, it's probably a blessing in disguise. So I just wrote Billy, just wrote him this fucking crazy, psychotic, long-term, like here's all the things I'm going through. And like, he answered back. I'm like, I have a pen pal who's one of the most famous rock stars in the world. That's going to answer back my, personal cries for help and i know. i know what that's like by the way yeah i bet <laughs> it's that's the one thing you and i can maybe we can start collecting rock stars and trade them back and forth like trading cards <laughs> well that you know i i mean you got you're gonna have to get a couple first round draft picks if you're getting me you know what i mean, I mean should set up the future yeah yeah that Man. was this has been great yeah, I had this could go on for another hour, and I don't. And we should do it again. Come back on. We'll, yeah, we'll, do it again. we'll do it again. We'll do it again. Absolutely. So, listen, fuckers, uh, the show's over. Go home. We're gonna say our goodbyes off the air. Love EC3. Listen, don't listen to the bullshit you see on the internet. You just sat here for almost an hour and listened to this guy talk. You fell in love with him. Get online. Put your chubby little fingers to work and say good things about him. You know, I got banned from Reddit doing my own AMA after all that bullshit came out. (laughs) I just answered every question openly and honestly with like complete facts and I'm I I host an AMA and I was banned from Reddit. <laughs> like, thanks, guy. Like, come on. That's really? internet punk rock right there. That's all I'm saying. All right, listen. Yeah, I'll probably get back on Twitter now that Elon's there. <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut, cut that out. Cut that out, cut. guys. No. Yeah. Put a muzzle on him. Put a muzzle <laughs> on him. <laughs> Hello, Ethan, thank you so much, man, for hanging out with us. Uh, everybody. Go follow him. Be cool to him. He deserves it. He's a great guy. I'm asking, not him, although he did uh, cash at me earlier. So thank you so much for hanging out with us. At the real EC3. And hey, no, I enjoyed this. And I say we do it again in January. Maybe the world is clearer. So that'd be cool. All right, man. 